Committee meeting for December 10th. I'd like to call the members to order. Uh, we have no formal regrets. Are there any declarations of interest? None today. Confirmation of minutes from Tuesday, November 12th. Are the minutes for the meeting confirmed? Carried, thank you. Okay, uh, we have three reports today, I believe. The first one is a designation of the Standard Bread Company Bakery at 951 Gladstone Avenue under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. I uh, want to remind uh, anyone in the gallery today that if anyone wishes to speak on any of our items, you can sign up at the front. And uh, after the presentation, we'll have an opportunity for comments if there are any. Um, we have Leslie Collins making a presentation today. Um, Leslie, we'll hand it over to you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, as you just heard, this report is recommending the designation of the Standard Bread Company Bakery at 951 Gladstone Avenue under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act. Just by means of a bit of background, uh, I'll start by saying that I'm very happy to have this in front of the committee today. Uh, this is my longest running file at the City of Ottawa. It's been on my desk for nine years. Um, in January 2010, we received our, uh, the original request to designate this property from uh, the Hintonburg Community Association. Um, at, it, shortly after we received that request, the property was sold uh, to a different property owner than is the current owner. And uh, the Hindenburg Community Association requested that we put the application on hold uh, pending redevelopment plans for the site. And so they were working with the former property owner on that. In November 2018, the Hindenburg Community Association reactivated their request to de designate after redevelopment plans were submitted by the current property owner, Trinity Developments. Um, and throughout this time, the city has always said that and always encouraged uh, the retention of this building and its incorporation into any future development of the site. So the property is located at 951 Gladstone Avenue, which is on the north side of Gladstone, just west of the O train tracks. Uh, it extends west to Loretta, but the building under consideration for designation is the one here at the corner. Um, you can see with the star. The Standard Bread Company Bakery was constructed in 1924, purpose-built as a commercial bakery for the Standard Bread Company, which was a local bakery that opened shortly before the end of the First World War. It served as a bakery until the late 1960s and then had various uses um, and was vacant for a period of time uh, until the Enriched Bread Artists Co-op rented the abandoned industrial building in the early 1990s. The building is a three-story building with a four-story tower and a high basement. It's constructed of reinforced concrete, clad in brick and pebble dash stucco. Uh, the brick was painted white at some point in the past and the stucco was added. We're not sure of the timing. The photo on the left shows the building prior to some storm damage that occurred in 2011 that required the removal of the parapet at the top of the building and the enclosing of two windows. Uh, the photo on the right shows you the building as it uh, looks today. The proposed redevelopment of this site uh, that you'll see later on in this presentation does include retention of this building. This is uh, the photo on the left shows you the rear facade and the photo on the right is the uh, west facade which is connected to a small strip mall uh, which were the former loading docks for the, um, for the factory. This is the east facade, so uh, standing sort of slightly below the building, it is located on a small hill just uh, up from the train tracks. Uh, you can really read the industrial character of the building from this facade. You have garage door openings. Um, you have some interesting uh, other openings that have been bricked up over time but are still visible uh, that would have been used for lifting hay and uh, various uh, materials into the building. In terms of the policy framework, uh, the official plan and the provincial policy statement both uh, encourage the designation of properties of cultural heritage value under part four of the Heritage Act. The provincial policy statement uh, states that significant built heritage resources and significant cultural heritage landscapes shall be conserved. Uh, this is the policy framework. You'll see that on the agenda today, we have, uh, I think, three designations. Rather than have my colleagues repeat this again, um, this is the same policy framework for all designations under the Ontario Heritage Act. Uh, and this slide as well is the same for all three. So section 29 of the Heritage Act gives municipalities the ability to designate properties of cultural heritage value. 
as long as they meet um, Ontario Regulation 0906, which requires that in order to be designated, a property must meet at least one of the following criteria, design value, historic or associative value, or contextual value. I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of how, uh, of the Standard Bread Company factory um, and how it meets the criteria for designation. As I mentioned, it was constructed in 1924. Um, the building is a good and a rare example of an early 20th century industrial building in Ottawa, constructed of reinforced cl concrete clad in brick with large windows. It is simple in its design, but it does feature some decorative elements, including the simple brick pilasters and the date stone. Um, these two photos, the one on the right is a historic photo from uh, a book from the Ottawa Public Library that I'm pretty sure over the last nine years, I'm the only one who has ever taken it out, called The Happy Baker of Ottawa. You can look it up if you're interested, about Cecil Morrison, um, who was Jean Pickett's father, in case you didn't know. Um, and the photo on the right is interesting. I just actually found it last week, despite nine years of research. Uh, there was a four-page spread in the Ottawa Journal in 1925 celebrating the opening of this building. Um, so this is just another uh, sort of ad advertisement for the concrete work of Ross Meager Company. Um, the bakery also has design value as a representative work of British-born architect uh, Sidney Comer. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, Comer Im immigrated to uh, Canada in 1907 and took position as the chief assistant to Montreal architect J.E. Adamson. Uh, he became well known for his design of bakery and dairy facilities across Canada in the early 20th century, including bakeries in Montreal, Toronto, Calgary, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, and Regina. Uh, and he worked in Montreal up until his death in the 1960s. Uh, one of the interesting things about this building is its structure. Um, and while the function of the building has changed, the elements of the interior still evoke its use as an industrial building. Its structure is supported by large flared mushroom columns uh, throughout the building. Uh, so the photo on the left is a uh, current photo uh, showing the interior columns that you see throughout the building. And then the photo on the right is also from that four page spread in the Ottawa Journal from 1925 um, showing uh, the concrete work of the building. Um, the use of these columns emerged in the early 20th century for industrial buildings as it allowed for large open spaces on the inside of the building. For the historical and associative value, um, the Standard Bread Company is associated with the, with, uh, with the company and with Ottawa businessmen and brothers-in-law Richard Lamoth and Cecil Morrison. Uh, the two opened, opened the Standard Bread Company in 1912 with a small bakery on uh, Hilson Avenue seen in the sketch above from the Ottawa Journal. Uh, Morrison was born in 1890 in West Quebec and moved to Ottawa in 1908 to live with his grandparents. He quickly um, worked a variety of jobs and then joined with his brother Dick Lamoth, in, uh, who was a baker, to start the Standard Bread Company in 1912. Together they built a small bakery on a vacant lot given to them by Morrison's parents. Um, soon after they opened the Hilson Bakery, Lamoth enlisted in the World, First World War. And by the early 1920s, the bakery was really flourishing and they required a larger facility. So in 1924, the new bakery on Gladstone Avenue was built. Uh, bread was baked and sold from the warehouse building and delivered uh, around Ottawa by horse and cart. Uh, you can see here Old Bill, who was the first horse owned by the Standard Bread Company. The, horses and, the horse and wagons were um, housed in the adjacent stables, which still exist on the site. Uh, however, they've been extremely altered and, and are not proposed for designation through this application. Uh, I briefly mentioned uh, Sidney Comer. Uh, this is just to show you uh, an image of him uh, and that he, we've been joking around the office that he had an ad in the paper knowing, calling himself the Bakitect because he was uh, well known for designing bakeries. Um, and again, this is just another historic photo showing the large sign which would have been visible from the uh, railway tracks. That's okay. The uh, contextual value of the building um, lies in, it, in uh, it being an important reminder of the former industrial character of this part of Hintonburg, which was known as Bayswater. Um, the bakery is a landmark in the neighborhood for its location at the top of a small hill adjacent to the railway tracks. You can still sort of see um, 
in the, fo in the aerial photo here that the character of this part of the neighborhood remains somewhat industrial. Uh, the uh, British banknote company is immediately to the west, which some members of the committee who've been around for a while may remember uh, discussions about this building several years ago. So just to recap, um, the Sandra Bread Company Bakery meets all three criteria for designation under, un under Ontario Regulation 0906. It has design value as a good example of an early 20th century industrial building. Uh, its design reflects its use as a factory. Uh, associative value for its association with the Standard Bread Company and uh, Cecil Morrison and Dick Lamoth. And it was designed by Sidney Comer, uh, a well-known bakery architect. Its contextual value is that it is a landmark for its location on a small hill adjacent to the railway tracks. In terms of consultation, uh, Councillor Leeper is aware of the proposed designation. Uh, the Hintonburg Community Association was notified, and as you are aware, they did request the designation, and I believe they've submitted a letter in support. Uh, Heritage Ottawa was also notified, and uh, I believe a letter was received yesterday also in support. Uh, the property owner is aware of and does not object to the proposed designation of this building. Um, this is just a little addendum because we don't normally talk about this in a designation uh, applicate or uh, report, uh, but just sort of a preview of what might be to come if, uh, if this building is designated. A development application for an official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment to allow for redevelopment of the property was submitted uh, in November 2018 to allow for a mixed-use uh, transit-oriented development. The proposal includes retention of the standard bread building and its rehabilitation and the construction of three high-rise towers of 30, 33, and 35 stories with a five-story podium. Um, the application, these, these applications are anticipated to be considered by Planning Committee and City Council in the new year. Um, we had originally hoped to have uh, both reports go to the same Planning Committee and Council, but due to scheduling changes, um, this one will now go first. But uh, it's... Uh, it's not a big issue because this is a designation as opposed to an application under the Heritage Act. Just give you another quick view of the proposed development. So you can see the building on the, uh, the building has been rehabilitated. They are proposing uh, to remove the white paint, reinstate the parapet, and some other alterations to the building. And then in terms of next steps, um, the recommendation to designate would be considered at planning committee in January. And then if the property is designated by city council, uh, an application to alter under the Ontario Heritage Act would be considered by built heritage subcommittee uh, during the site plan control uh, process. So you would see this proposal again um, in terms of the specific alterations to the building and be, we would be seeking uh, your, your uh, views on that. So that's, that's it for me. We are recommending designation of this building under Part 4 of the Heritage Act. Thank you, Leslie. That was an excellent presentation. Um, delegations. Linda Hode, do you want to start us off? On behalf of the uh, Hintonburg Community Association, we have received a letter, but I think we should hear it directly from you. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and good morning. Um, yes, it has been a long time since we first requested designation of this building, and we're convinced by the owner that um, they would let us know if any change was about to occur, and then we could go forward with the designation. Unfortunately, they didn't follow through. Um, so a new owner acquired it and pr is proposing the development that you see before you. So we reinstated our request. and I. Um, we are obviously in full support. Um, this is a very important building in the community, not only for the reasons that, um, that, that uh, Leslie Collins has outlined, but because it uh, is the studios of the enriched bread artists, which were, uh, have been there since the 1990s and were one of the reasons why Hintonburg declared itself an arts district a number of years ago. Um, we are very concerned that the artists may be forced to leave, so we will be working with the uh, city, enriched bread artists, um, and the developer to ensure that there is, that the building remains as affordable studio space for artists. It's not uh, your purview, of course, but I thought you might like to know that. Um, the other thing I was think when I was thinking about this, it occurred to me that we actually owe those artists. If they had not occupied this building, 
since 1990, and certainly hasn't had much work done it, on it from uh, everything I can see. Um, this building might have been uh, subject to demolition by neglect or possibly demolition. So um, I think we need to, to be grateful to them for maintaining this building in a productive use for this many years. And I also wanted to uh, thank um, Leslie and her colleagues or whoever prepared this report. I had done some preliminary research on this building before submitting the request. I was absolutely amazed at what she, uh, what she was able to find out even if it did take nine or I 10 years. years. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, some of the, and you just found out some of it yesterday. Yeah. So um, it, it really, if you haven't had time to read the full report, I recommend that you do so. It is really very, very interesting. Um, not just because it's in Hindenburg, but because it is a part of Ottawa's social history. And in addition to um, G uh, Jean Piggott, the other Morrison girls are Greet Hale and Gay Cook, who still live in uh, the Civic Hospital neighborhood. So it, it has a real, uh, a real background in Ottawa's history, so I urge you to, to uh, designate it, although I'm sure you will. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, Leslie, I, I think uh, I just mentioned to Councillor McKenney, who was a little bit late arriving, I said, uh, you missed a great presentation. I think Leslie's just raised the bar very high for all of your heritage colleagues with that presentation and the report as well. Anyhow, um, David Fleming, did you want to speak on this, um, add anything to it? or? from Heritage Ottawa. Thanks, David. And I, I know uh, Scott Alain is here from FOTEN as well, if required, but I have a feeling the committee's probably ready to accept this. But I wanna go to questions. Uh, do any, um, I think Councillor Moffat had a question for staff on this? Okay. I'm pretty sure this is already answered, but it, right at the tail end of your presentation, there's just the, the notion that the way the building looks today with that odd hideous stucco thing on the front and then the white paint that the designation won't hinder its ability to be restored back to its its original glory uh yes through you mr chair we would not be forcing it to look as it is today we are hoping for its rehabilitation no, for sure. and restoration. i just want to make sure it's not going to all of a sudden add some extra step or something for the applicant because clearly their plan is a lot better than what the building looks like today. Yes, and we have not included the white paint or the stucco as heritage attributes of the building. Thanks. Any other questions from our committee members? Okay, I'm, I'm thrilled with this uh, recommendation. I, I really thought when I first heard about potential development on this site, I was pessimistic about the ability to save this one. So uh, credit to planning staff and to the current owner and applicant as well for taking the initiative to uh, to protect this and to the Hintonburg Community Association for also pushing very hard over the last several years. So are the report recommendations carried? Carried. Carried, thank you. So this, uh, this report will go to planning committee on January 23rd. Okay, we're moving on now from downtown out to Cumberland, designation of the former Traders Bank of Canada, 1824 Farwell Street under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. And we have uh, Cass Sl Sclazero, sorry Cass, uh, with a presentation. You've got to follow that presentation from Leslie. Big shoes to fill. That's right, to be fair, Leslie had nine years to, uh, to come up with that. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is also my longest designation uh, report because it is my first one. So. It's taken about three months. Uh, so, uh, good morning. Um, this report uh, being presented today uh, recommends um, the designation of the former Traders Bank building at 1824 Farwell Street uh, in VARS under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act. Uh, the building was constructed in 1910 by the Traders Bank of Canada. It became a Royal Bank branch in 1912 and was converted to a residence in the 1950s. Uh, for those of you who don't know where VARS is, it's um, located in, uh, in the rural east uh, side of the city in the south part of the former Cumberland Township, um, east, southeast of Cumberland Springs, uh, almost in, uh, at the border of, uh, of the city. 
Uh, the property is located on the south side of Farwell Street uh, between Buckland Road to the west and Suprenant Walk to the east. The former Canada Atlantic Railway line runs parallel to Farwell Street uh, just north of, uh, of Farwell. So these photos show the front and side elevations of the building. Uh, 1820, <coughs> excuse me, 1824 Farwell Street is a two-story building. Uh, it's clad in red brick with a raised parge foundation and a flat roof that slopes toward the rear. The three-bay front facade features evenly spaced windows and window and door openings and a small concrete porch. The eastern facade features a trio of windows on the main and second floor, and the western facade features a single window with a flat arch. Uh, it was likely a later addition. Uh, so detailed photos uh, show uh, some of the, uh, the characteristics we identified for design value, uh, including uh, segmental arches with voussoirs over the window and door openings, stone sills, and a transom over the front door. Uh, the front facade features a flush eaves and a flat projecting cornice, and you can sort of make it out in the, in the photos, but the faded area below the cornice indicates where the bank sign was previously mounted. Uh, a small bit of trivia, the owner says that the uh, front door came from 20, 20, oh no, 24, 22 Sussex? Prime Minister's residence. It's 24. <laughs> 24, I always get them mixed up. Anyway, that is where the door is from, apparently. Uh, so uh, just uh, the streetscape for context, uh, two views of Farwell Street. Uh, the first uh, is looking east towards Suprenant Walk, and uh, the white building is the former Fraser's General Store. Uh, the second photo is taken from in front of the former General Store, looking west toward Buckland Road. Uh, so these photos uh, from 1949 show 1824 Farwell as it appeared when it was a Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, you can see the, the sign is in place, the cornice is a bit more uh, um, pronounced, and there's uh, the decals in the windows. So in terms of meeting criteria under uh, Regulation 906 of the Ontario Heritage Act, uh, the former Traders Bank building meets the design or physical value criteria uh, as a rare and representative example of a style or building type. It's one of only five brick buildings and the only brick commercial building still remaining in VARS. The former bank building has, a design, has design value as a good example of an early 20th century village commercial building constructed in the vernacular style with a symmetrical facade, segmental arch openings, brick voussoirs, and stone sills. It's also a rare surviving example of one of the 104 Traders Bank branches uh, constructed by the Traders Bank in a number of villages across the province. So I found, um, I searched uh, through every uh, village that had a Traders Bank, uh, and I was able to find four that resembled the VARS branch. Uh, so from left to right, there's the Chaplow, uh, Burgessville, Embrun, and Massey branches with the VARS branch in the center. Uh, all the other uh, buildings have either been demolished or heavily altered. Uh, the Chapelot branch was designed by F.S. Baker, who was the president of the Royal uh, Architectural Institute of Canada uh, and the designer of the Traders Bank head office in Toronto. So it's possible that the Chapelot, um, uh branch design was reused in VARS or that he designed the VARS branch himself. So the property meets the historical or associated value criteria for its association with VARS as a prosperous railway village in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and with the Traders Bank of Canada and the Royal Bank of Canada. VARS was first settled in the 1880s as a railway village at the junction of the Canada Atlantic Railway uh, between Montreal and Ottawa and the Bearbrook Road, which was a forced road connecting the village of Russell to the Ottawa River. At the time, the settlement was known as Bearbrook Station. Just a few years later, the village had been renamed Vars and had a hotel, a sawmill, a church, a cheese factory, and several stores. By 1908, there were four churches, a Sashendorf factory, and a telegraph office, and the bank arrived in 1910. The Traders Bank uh, served primarily agricultural communities across Ontario in the late 19th and, 20th, and early 20th centuries. In 1912, the Traders Bank was acquired by the Royal Bank of Canada, and all Traders Bank branches became Royal Banks. The VARS branch served residents in and around VARS and Navin until the Royal Bank opened in Navin in the 1920s. As road transportation improved between VARS and Ottawa and automobile ownership increased and as residents found work in Ottawa and thus had easier uh, access to the shops and services offered there, the stores and services in VARS saw less business and most eventually closed. 
Daily passenger train service between Vars and Ottawa ceased operation in the 1950s, around the time the bank closed and the building was converted to a single family residence. And our photos uh, show the property as it appeared in 1934. And again, you can see the, the Fraser's General Store in the background behind it. And then we have a streetscape looking north on Buckland Road from the hotel toward the many shops that once existed in Vars um, around 1909. Uh, so 1824, Farwell meets criteria for contextual value because of its historical connection to its surroundings. The building is one of a few, one of few remaining former commercial buildings in Vars, all of which have also since been converted to residences. The building is located on what was once the village's secondary commercial street, running east from the main commercial area on Buckland Road and parallel to the railway. When the bank was constructed, the street was home to a general store, the Methodist church, and the doctor's office. So the photo on the left shows um, Farwell Street looking west toward the Methodist Church in 1909. So just before the bank was built, and it was actually built on the empty lot next to uh, the church. Uh, the bird's eye photo shows Vars in 1976. It's not a great photo, but uh, the arrow is pointing toward um, uh, the bank. Uh, the railway bisects the photo from top to bottom, uh, right through the center, and then Buckland Road, which is the main commercial strip, uh, kind of goes um, left to right across the photo near the top. So as for consultation, um, 1824 Farwell was first identified uh, for its cultural heritage value through the Heritage Inventory Project, uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, the owner was notified in April 2019 that staff intended to add the property to the register as a non-designated listing. And following the notification, the owner actually uh, initiated the designation herself. Uh, staff met with the owner in person in April and August of 2019 to conduct site visits. Um, the owner had already conducted significant research into the property and had a massive binder of information about the property, about the Royal Bank, about the Traders Bank, and about VARS in general. Uh, and she was very happy to share this information with me uh, to help me prepare the, um, the report. Uh, and I was in regular communication with her throughout the process, including up to um, 8.30 this morning. Um, the property was listed on the Heritage Register following council approval on November 27, 2019. Uh, Councillor Blay was notified of the designation, uh, Heritage Ottawa was notified of the designation, and the VARS Community Association was notified of the designation. Uh, the VARS Community Association said, that is cool, uh, when I notified them, so they're in support of the designation. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, staff have determined that 1824 Farwell Street meets the criteria for designation under uh, Ontario Regulation 906 of the Ontario Heritage Act, and we recommend that the Built Heritage Subcommittee recommend that Council issue a notice of intention to designate the property located at 1824 Farwell under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act. Thank you. Thank you, Cass. That was also an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Brockington has a question for staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just basic question. When you say that the um, property was listed on the Heritage Register last month, what does that mean uh, given the context of what we're being asked to decide today? Uh, thanks for the question. So uh, it was it was mostly procedural. We we knew that the property was kind of in the docket for being designated, um, but uh, because the report was going to the report for the heritage inventory project was going to council before uh, today, we wanted to add it to the the register as a listed property just for our records um, in case that for some reason at the last minute there was a delay or, or anything with uh, with getting this report through. So the designation is different from the listing? That's correct, yeah. Okay, thank you. Member Hustle. I just wanted to comment that it's, it's really great to hear a story like this where the Heritage Inventory Project and all of the city's tireless work on it uh, has led a property owner who already had a, a really keen interest in their home by the sounds of it uh, to step up and approach the city and ask for designation and try and protect this. Uh, my question for you, more of a curiosity, and I don't know if you can disclose it, but did this property owner, uh, did she have any connection to the, the bank or the history of this place, or was she just very keen? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, she, she actually has a ton of family members that work for the Royal Bank. Um, she bought the property knowing uh, a little bit about the history and uh, she was, she's always been into to research and, and history and, and she, um, she was actually able to obtain the old, um, uh, the gate, the teller's 
kind of cage that protected the tellers from like, I guess the angry mobs in bars uh, from the neighbor next door. Uh, and uh, another uh, relative uh, found an old um, bank counter from the, another Royal Bank branch and gave it to her. So she has that as her kitchen counter. Her whole front entry is decorated with like Royal Bank and Traders Bank like memorabilia. Um, and she actually, um, uh, works in a nursing home, and one of her um, her residents uh, used to. Did she? I think she said she she worked at the Royal Bank or the Traders Bank in in Vars. So she's got all these amazing connections, and uh, and yeah, she's she's just very interested in the history of it. She's very proud of her community, and uh, and actually, she's um, this would be the first designation in Vars, and she's she's thrilled about that as well, and hopes that her neighbors are going to get on the bandwagon as well. And yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, one more thing that just sort of came to mind as you were talking about this binder that she's compiled and all the people she's got on board with this. I don't know if the City of Ottawa Archives is in the habit of collecting material relating to designated properties, uh, but maybe if, if you have the time amid all your fantastic presentations, if this is the sort of thing they're looking for, uh, it may be worth dropping a line to the property owner. Yeah, I think uh, I think she's happy to share. I know a lot of the things she received came from the Royal Bank archives, and they are less forthcoming with their material. But um, it's possible that if we keep it internal with the city, that we can share that with the archives. But that's a great suggestion. Thanks. Any other questions from members? All right. Um, we did get a um, a letter on file, correspondence on file from Heritage Ottawa. And I wanted to highlight this at some point today. Um, we have three reports recommending designation and they all come proactively. Uh, they all come from the owners. And um, in at least, well, at least this case was also, um, there was a relation to the uh, inventory project. But um, the letter from David Fleming, who's here, just highlights how Heritage Auto has been advocating the city. And I think a lot of us here council and committee members have as well, to be more proactive in our approach to heritage. And um, I'll just note the letter says, uh, we are pleased that the excellent work on the recently completed heritage inventory project has provided a foundation for these and future designations. So um, you know, we often hear a lot about some of the bad news stories that come through this committee and others, but I think we've got uh, three really good news stories about being proactive in um, in preserving and enhancing our built heritage. So um, I think that's worth noting. Are the report recommendations carried? Carried, thank you. So this, uh, well, that report that we've just carried goes to council at the end of January. And the next item on the agenda is in Capital Ward. Councillor Menard is here, thanks Councillor Menard. It's designation of the Ottawa Tennis and Lawn Bowling Club at 176. Cameron Avenue under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. And our planner for this file is Ashley Katarba. Good morning. Oh, but, okay, Cass is doing the, no. Who's doing the, oh, okay. Hi, Avery Marshall. I worked on the survey form and the statement of significance for this property and Ashley's uh, been guiding me through. Because like, like Cass, it's my first designation report as well. Uh, just give me a minute, I'll get it up. Uh, we prepared a very brief presentation for you following the other two. It's going to be a bit shorter, but certainly uh, uh, not any less significant. Uh, so this report in front of you today recommends the designation of the property at 176 Cameron Avenue. This is the Ottawa Tennis and Lawn Bowling Club under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act. The property is located on the south side of Cameron Avenue in Old Ottawa South. The property rears onto the Rideau River, just, uh, and you can see in the photos, just to provide some additional context, there's an aerial view on the right, and it shows the clubhouse, tennis courts, volleyball courts, and an outdoor swimming pool. Built in 1922 to 1923, the Ottawa Tennis and Lawn Bowling Club is a two and a half story uh, building with a hipped roof, rough cast stucco cladding and mock half timbering. The club itself was founded in 1881 and it, uh, tennis through that, that club was first played here near where we are now at Elgin and Lisgar. 
The club moved a number of times uh, as it grew and it moved further and further south uh, out to the city limits and eventually opened a location on Camp Cameron Avenue in 1923. Uh, th these photos show on the left the main entrance on the north facade as well as a view from the second floor gallery and that looks south over the tennis courts towards the Rideau River. And another view, this is closer to the river looking north back at the building through the tennis courts. So just briefly on design value, uh, the Ottawa Tennis and Lawn Bowling Club does have a design value as a good example of a recreational clubhouse um, and of recreational clubhouse architecture from the 1920s. It features a number of design elements associated also with Tudor revival style, such as the stucco cladding and mock half timbering. Um, the, here's a summary. So the historical value built in 1922 to 23, as I mentioned, the Ottawa Tennis and Lawn Bowling Club reflects early 20th century middle-class life in Ottawa, and also an era when tennis and lawn bowling were becoming popular sports for the middle class in Canada. The Ottawa Tennis Club uh, has historical value as is with its association with John Albert Ewart, a recognized Ottawa architect who lived on Cameron Avenue. His parents also lived on Cameron Avenue, so he knew the area well. Uh, in terms of context, the the club has a lot of contextual value as a landmark in Old Ottawa South. It has been continuously used as a sports club since 1923, so almost 100 years, and it's a notable feature on the shore of the Rideau River. So uh, as uh, with the last report, this property actually was identified also through the Heritage Inventory Project through its, uh, one of its earliest reports back in 2017 uh, for Old Ottawa South and East. Um, and since that time, the property owner has come forward and asked for the property to be designated. So the club requested its designation and it recently its board met on it and the board is supportive. Ward Councillor Maynard, who's here, is aware of the recommendations and is supportive. And also Heritage Ottawa was notified of the designation. In conclusion, the building um, at 176 Cameron Avenue meets all three criteria, design, history, and context of Ontario Regulation 906, and our department recommends issuance of a notice of intent to designate under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act. Whoops, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to start with Councillor Menard. Thanks very much, Chair. appreciate that. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, the plan at this site uh, in the future is to look at doing some renovations to, to the building. Um, how will designation affect some of those plans? Most of them are on the in interior of it, of it but uh, will that affect any of the plans um, for renovation? Uh, thank you, Councillor. The plans as um, the clubhouse is sort of the club has notified us of are to do renovations, you're correct, mostly interior. Um, the exterior is being included in designation only, no interior uh, elements are being included, so uh, only if they're touching the exterior, which I think they'll be doing maybe some window changes or re restoration work will be, um, be required to have a heritage permit for those types of work. So anything inside will not be included in that. Okay, that's great. In terms of the property itself, the surrounding lands, uh, how will the designation affect those lands, the, the green space that's there? Uh, the whole parcel will be designated as part of this, or this uh, proposal here. And um, any changes to, if they want to construct any other outbuildings or take something else down, they do have some um, sort of shed, <coughs> sorry, sheds <coughs> that would need to be uh, passed through us and we'd look at that for, to see whether permits required. Okay, great, thank you so much. Appreciate your work. Thank you, Councillor Menard. Councillor Brockington. Thank you, Chair. Um, do you know why the owners requested this designation? Uh, yes, I do. Actually, they have also applied for another grant through the federal government called the, um, the second tier, the Building Communities Through Arts and Heritage, Heritage Legacy Fund. They're hoping to be successful in getting, um, I think, $500,000 from the federal government for their restoration plans. And in order to help support their application, they, um, were, it was recommended by the government to um, apply for designation under the Ontario Heritage Act to help support and improve their chances of getting this grant. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, 
And just to Councillor Menard's last question, given the amount of land, you said the entire perimeter is being designated. If they want to make some modifications to the actual tennis court, swimming pool, does that also have to come through you? We would certainly look at it and determine whether um, the change is appropriate and whether a permit would be required okay. for such so work. So even though the, the main clubhouse building is the driver behind the designation, anything that they want to change on the outside has to come through the city? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. should note too, um, this report will be presented to Council tomorrow and part of that reason is uh, uh, to allow, uh, allow the property owner, in this case, to uh, complete their application to the federal government for that grant, I believe. So we've uh, agreed to move a little quicker in terms of uh, rising this to Council. Member Podolsky. My only disappointment in the report was that it was so short. As a tennis player, I was expecting the next hour to hear a full uh, history of the uh, Ottawa Lawn Tennis Club, but I'll try to withhold my disappointment in that. Uh, I just wanted to uh, add my voice to what the chair has uh, said about the designations that have come forward this morning from uh, three property owners that have voluntarily uh, come forward to designate the property. I think that's a very good news story. And uh, I just wanted to uh, say that I will obviously support this designation. And uh, I guess because the whole property is designated, that means that uh, the courts will be perfectly maintained because there won't be any demolition by neglect. And Member Halsell. Yes, uh, I think it's fantastic that we've had three applications come forward this morning, and I won't repeat all of the praise that the chair and member Podolsky and, and the rest of us have already said. I'm curious, though, is the city keeping track of, of requests that have come forward as a result of the Heritage Inventory Project? It might be sort of interesting to keep tabs on what changes we've seen in citizen requests and procedure. Um, it could be useful down the road. You know your shop better than I do, of course, so perhaps you're already doing that. Uh, it would be nice to see in the reports on occasion as well, though, just as a nice reminder for us. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? All right. Are the report recommendations carried? Carried. Thank you. All right, and our final report today is an application to alter 124 Bottler Street, a property in lower, the Lower Town West Heritage Conservation District designated under Part 5 of the Ontario Heritage Act. And we have a brief presentation from Mackenzie Kim this morning. Okay, good morning. Uh, so this application uh, to alter relates to the property at 124 Bottler Street, as you heard. Um, it's a property designated under Part 5 of the Ontario Heritage Act as part of the Lower Town West Heritage Conservation District. Uh, the property contains a one and a half story uh, wood frame building and it's a category two building in the district. This property is located on the south side of Bottler Street, mid-block between Dalhousie and Cumberland uh, at the northeast boundary of the Lower Town West HCD. Um, this building is the last house in the district and it forms um, part of this group of five modest 19th century buildings. Um, so this house is a very early example of the front gable house form in Lower Town, constructed uh, circa 1864. And since its construction, the building uh, has undergone a number of uh, alterations, including the addition of the dormers, the removal of its front porch and recladding, as well as changes to the windows and their openings, and alterations to the foundation uh, in order to raise the basement. 
so this property might seem familiar to the committee as the owner received approval earlier this fall um, for the construction of a new two-story rear addition as well as some repairs to the main house including reinstating a sympathetic front porch so today this application is before the committee because after receiving that approval and starting with the work the owner and his engineers have found uh, that the foundation is in a very advanced stage of deterioration um, so much so that they need to be completely replaced um, so accordingly this application is requesting permission to lift the building in order to remove the existing foundation and pour new ones um, additionally having um, finalize the floor plans. Uh, the owner also, also wishes to slightly amend the design for the rear addition by adding a dormer uh, on the east side. Um, so this dormer will have horizontal siding to match the previously approved rear addition um, and it will be largely obscured by the uh, mature trees that currently line the property. Um, so staff have reviewed this proposal against the Lower Town um, HCD guidelines, which encourage the conservation of all buildings, uh, including those that are not highly intact, like this one, and ensure that um, new construction is compatible with the character of the HCD. And staff are of the opinion that the proposal will allow for the retention of the building, um, which will conserve the history of the site and the value of the HCD. Um, a condition of approval has been included to ensure that the overall height of the um, house is maintained. And additionally, as noted in the report, um, in the conditional report provided by the uh, engineer, um, given the age of this building, as you can imagine, um, there's a potential for the integrity of some of the other elements of this building to, that are currently stable to become unstable. Um, so we've also included a condition that the applicant provide detailed um, stamped engineered drawings from the uh, house lifting company um, just to outline the, uh, how the building will be secured and protected during that process um, prior to the issuance of a building permit. Um, so this proposal has also been reviewed against the standards and guidelines. Um, and staff are satisfied that they uh, that this proposal meets those um, those standards and guidelines, and uh, are recommending approval um, out, as outlined on in the report, um, subject to the conditions outlined in that report, as well as the standard delegation of minor design changes, uh, the two-year expiry for the heritage permit. Um, you'll also notice there's a fifth um, recommendation, and that's for council. To, um, to be able to consider this application at their meeting tomorrow on December 11th, and that's in order to meet the standard, uh, this 90-day um, timeline for applications under the Act. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from committee members? Okay. Um, I know we also have, um, we also have uh, two of the consultants for the owners um, who are ready to speak if required, but I'll go to Councillor, uh, sorry, to Member Quinn first. Vice Chair Quinn first. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question pertains to, because of course this is, we've seen this property before, um, and it, I remember the last presentation there was some discussion around um, the possibility of the owner reinstating the front porch. I'm just wondering if uh, there's been any, any news. I mean, we hear that they'd like to make additional changes to the extension with the dormer. Uh, was there any discussion around the reinstatement of the porch? Thank you. Um, we have been discussing the, the front porch and I think it's still, um, we're still working out some of the details. There's some issues with some of the encroachments, but I think, um, I think we're close and working with the other um, city departments on that. Um, and we're looking into you know, eligibility for the grant program as well. So it's certainly still on the table. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Brockington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I certainly um, understand the logic behind yeah, the staff's um, recommendation, and I have no issues with that. I just want to make sure that before staff agrees to make this recommendation that you go through all of the reports regarding the foundation, everything that their engineers have provided. The City of Ottawa reviews that before you make a recommendation. Is that correct? Yes, that's okay, correct. Very good. Okay, I, I think, as I said, as staff argues that um, you know we could refuse this, and the building ends up 
further decaying or, or self-collapsing that um, we're trying to preserve as much as we can. So um, given what is being proposed, I'm supportive of what's uh, before us. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from our committee members? If not, then are the report recommendations carried? Carried, thank you. So this rises to council tomorrow and we uh, have no in-camera items. Uh, information previously distributed, we have a summary of designation refusals from 2019. And uh, we have received the memo by email and it's been listed on the agenda as well. Any notices of motion for consideration at a subsequent meeting? Okay, and uh, any inquiries for staff? Member Podolsky. It's not so much an inquiry to staff, but it's to draw attention to the report on refusals. I think that is worthwhile for all members of the Built Heritage Subcommittee to carefully read the report and also members of council and the public and community groups. I think it's important that this uh, process was initiated uh, by the Built Heritage Subcommittee to periodically get a report on refusals because I think what it shows is that um, the heritage staff and uh, community groups and uh, built heritage subcommittee are not zealots that will designate everything from 1880 and on and that the process of evaluation um, has a certain credibility because the identification of certain properties that were proposed for designation, like the four listed here, have been deemed by staff being not worthy of designation, the merits of which probably could be debated. But I think that it's always important to pause for a moment and realize that uh, what there is a scrupulous process that is undertaken to evaluate. And some properties, although on the face of it, might look like they deserve to be designated. Uh, don't make the cut when you apply the criteria. So I think I just wanted to comment on that to draw the committee's attention to uh, this process, which shows the work that's being done in the background. And it's not all um, what some people might think as being um, a committee that will designate anything that moves. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's no other business today. So on adjournment, is the motion carried? Carried. We are adjourned. Uh, next meeting is January 14th, 2020. Thanks, everybody. And don't forget to ch go put on hold at the library the Happy Baker of Ottawa. There'll be a lot of holds on that after today's meeting. Take care.